Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Tools to Thrive, How to Achieve Better Mental Health. We're so glad you could join us today to talk about this important topic. Thank you so much for being here. Before we begin, a little about Jefferson Center. We're a nonprofit, community-focused mental health care and substance use services provider and have been serving Jefferson County, Clear Creek County, and Gilpin County for over 60 years. We offer hope and support to individuals and families who are struggling with mental health issues and substance use disorders. Over the last few months, we have all felt a strain on our mental health as we've adjusted and coped with various aspects of life. However, even in difficult times in life, it's possible to have good mental health. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Angela Quinn. Angela is a licensed professional clinician here at Jefferson Center and has been practicing for over 10 years. And she's gonna be talking more today about using different tools to address things like fatigue and burnout, adjusting to big changes in life, and how to reach and maintain good mental health. Um, before I turn the mic over to Angela, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, first, please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video during the presentation. Uh, you'll also want to change your Zoom view to speaker mode for the best viewing presentation. If you have a question for Angela, please feel free to send it through the chat at the bottom of your player. Um, we'll be answering questions at the end of the session, and if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. Um, next, today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session, and we'll email that out to you, and we'll also have today's slide deck available. I would also encourage you to visit our website at jcmh.org, where we have more resources available, along with blog posts related to this topic and more information about other upcoming webinars we'll be hosting. And last, we'd like to encourage you to follow us on our social networks and share the recording of this webinar and other information about Jefferson Center. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Angela. Angela, over to you. Thank you. So like we just discussed, our key objectives today in Tools to Thrive is how to recognize and cope with burnout how to boost your mental health when staying home and adjusting to big life changes. So we're gonna be talking about the tools to thrive when in those specific scenarios. So we'll just go to our first slide to um, burnout. There's three different types of burnout. And in most cases, um, when people talk about burnout, they're referring to professional burnout. However, there are other factors to consider if you're feeling the symptoms of burnout. There's individual burnout, which is caused when you place extremely high standards on yourself or believe nothing you do is good enough. Then there's interpersonal burnout, where it's caused by difficult relationships with others at work and at home. An example of that would be an aggressive or unwelcoming boss or coworker that combined with the stress you already feel at work. Then you have organizational, burn, organizational burnout, which is caused by poor organization, extreme demands and unrealistic deadlines that make you feel like you're missing um, the mark and your job is in danger and you may lose your job. So with recognizing burnout, so I just want to, there we go. So with recognizing burnout, um, you're going to look at the alienation from work-related activities. Individuals who are experiencing burnout view their jobs as increasingly stressful and frustrating. They may grow cynical about their work. Um, cynical about their working conditions um, and the people that they even work with. They may also emotionally distance themselves and be begin to feel numb about their work. So then you also have physical symptoms like chronic stress may lead to physical symptoms like headaches, stomach aches, intestinal issues. Um, a lot of individuals will say, you know, I was fine until I started, I got out of my car and was walking into work. And that's when I started having a stomach ache or a headache. 
Um, so things like that. Then you have also an emotional exhaustion. Burnout causes people to feel drained and unable to cope and tired. Um, so they often lack the energy to get their work done or even finished by the end of the day and the deadlines. Also, you'll see a lot of um, uh, reduced performance. So burnout mainly affects everyday tasks at work. On the on in the home when someone's main job involves caring for a family member, individuals with burnout feel negative about tasks. So they have difficulty concentrating and often lack creativity. So um, this may look like an uh, individual um, at, at, at the beginning of their job feeling excited about their job, having passion for their job, and showing that they have all kinds of creative ideas, but then you slowly notice that it's dwindling down. Um, you're not feeling as creative. You're not even feeling like your job is maybe even worth it. So that's more of what it would look like. And um, going to our next slide. Lead other things um, that are issues. So it shares some similar symptoms of mental health conditions, such as depression. Individuals with depression experience negative feelings and thoughts about all aspects of their life, though. So that's what to keep in mind there. When experiencing burnout, it's typically going to be related to your job specifically. You're mainly going to go um, down all day long, but specifically down when you're at work or experiencing these specific symptoms when at work. Um, so depression symptoms may also include a loss of interest in things, feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, um, cognitive and physical symptoms, as well as thoughts of suicide. So depression looks a little different than burnout, but burnout symptoms could definitely move towards um, um, more severe symptoms of depression. So that's something to really be aware of and look for. Individuals experiencing burnout also may, may be at higher risk at developing depression because they're already unhappy with their employment. So it would be even more, um, you know, even more easier for you to just say, okay, well, I'm happy with unemployment, which then sort of goes over into maybe home life, and then I become happy, at, unhappy at home because the stress is leaking over from work into the home. And then maybe even other aspects of your life. So that's when you really realize that, okay, this is not just work anymore. This is leading to issues in other parts of my life, and maybe this is turning into something a little bigger. Okay, so moving on to the next slide of uh, risk factors. A high stress job doesn't always lead to burnout, okay? If stress is managed well and you have good coping skills, um, there can be there can be situations where you have high stress jobs, but you're not um, going to experience burnout. A lot of this, we'll talk about this more um, later on, but a lot of this includes good self-care, taking care of yourself. Um, and using good coping skills to deal with that stress. But some individuals um, and those in certain occupations are at higher risk than others, mainly ones that have unreasonable time pressure. Employees who say they have enough time to do their work are 70% less likely to experience high burnout. So individuals who are not able to gain more time, such as paramedics and firefighters, they are at higher risk for burnout. Other jobs or occupations where they have unfair treatment. Employees who feel they're treated unfairly at work are 2.3 times more likely to experience a high level of burnout. 
unfair treatment may include things such as favoritism, unfair um, compensation, or even mistreatment of your coworkers or your supervisors. Lack of communication and support from a manager is another issue that can lead to burnout. Manager support offers a psychological buffer against stress. So employees who feel strongly supported by their managers are typically 70% less likely to experience burnout on a regular basis. Then you have a role that has lack of clarity, lack of role clarity. Um, only 60% of workers know what it is expected of them. When expectations are like moving targets, employees may become exhausted simply by trying to figure out what they are supposed to be doing. So if you're confused about what you're supposed to be doing, or if you're confused about the meaning of what your job is doing or what um, your occupation is doing, you're going to be more likely to move towards burning out. Unmanageable workloads. When a workload feels unmanageable, even the most optimistic employees um, will feel hopeless. If you over, if you overload an individual um, and you make them feel overwhelmed, it can quickly lo uh, lead to burnout. So, we're going to go to the next slide of uh, prevention and treatment. Although the term burnout suggests it may be um, a permanent condition, it's not. It's definitely reversible. An individual who's feeling burned out may need to make some changes in their work environment, but as long as they can do that, most of the time, the burnout can turn around. So some of those suggestions might be approaching human resources, um, department about problems in the workplace or talking to a supervisor about the issues could always be helpful, especially if they are invested in creating a healthier work environment. Now, you really, sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes you may go to human resources or your higher ups and find out that, oh, they're really not listening to me. Well, then that's something that you need to consider when and understand that if you continue to feel like you're not being heard or you're not in a healthy work environment, you're more likely to continue getting burnout. In some cases, a change in position or a new job altogether within the same agency can even help burnout. Um, it can also be helpful to develop clear strategies that help you manage your stress. Self-care strategies like eating a healthy diet, getting plenty of exercise and engaging in healthy sleep habits can also reduce some of the effects of a high stress job. A vacation uh, can always offer temporary relief of burnout, but keep in mind that if you continue to feel the same way about your job and you keep the same position and you continue to feel unheard, then a vacation is only going to be a temporary fix. It's nice while it lasts, but once you come back, it typically goes back to the burnout phase. Um, if you're experiencing difficulty uh, with burnout and you suspect that you may also have a mental condition such as depression or anxiety on top of the burnout, it would be a really good uh, time to seek professional help and to get some more clarity um, because talking to a mental health professional can help you discover the strategies you need to feel like you're at your best self. So that is, you know, definitely um, a situation when you would realize that, yeah, um, in the event that the um, burnout is causing issues in other portions of your life, or in the event that your sadness or other symptoms became increasingly um, prevalent, then you definitely, or if you've already been diagnosed with any type of mental health issue and are also experiencing burnout, definitely I would suggest to seek professional help in all of those cases and um, try to work that out and talk it out because it definitely can be turned around, okay? Um, 
So the next uh, objective and key point of this presentation in regards to tools to thrive is how to boost your mental health when staying at home. Okay, so got a lot of tips and things to try. Um, just understand that all of these are not going to be good for everybody. You may try one of these and not find relief in it at all, and that's okay. But I do encourage you to try more than one and to try them more than one time. Um, sometimes we may be in a, diff a better mood one day versus the other, and you may um, be more susceptible to one thing actually um, boosting your mental health versus others, okay? So one is to track your gratitude and an achievement with a journal. One thing I would suggest is uh, tracking three things that you're grateful for and three things that you are able to accomplish each day. If you only write those six things down, that's a good way to start a gratitude journal. Start your day with a cup of coffee. Coffee consumption is linked to actual lower rates of depression. If you can't drink coffee because of the caffeine, try another good for you drink like green tea. You could also set up a getaway. It could be camping with friends on a trip to the tropics. The act of planning a vacation, and because of COVID, I want you to really hear this part. Just the act of planning a vacation and having something to look forward to can boost your overall happiness for up to eight weeks. So keep that in mind. Even though we are still socially distancing right now, um, we still, just the fact of having something to look forward to, and even, um, even if it's a month or two or a year from now, that can give us overall happiness for up to eight weeks. That's really cool. So just that um, something to look forward to. Work your strength is another suggestion. Um, do something you're good at and that you're that will build your self-confidence. Start out with something that you know you're good at and try to um, begin to learn other things later. But to build that self-confidence, first work or do that work on things or do things that you're really you feel that you're good at. Keep it cool for a good night's sleep. And remember, the optimal temperature for sleep is between 60 and 67 degrees Fahrenheit. So with our days getting warmer, that's something to really remember. If you want to boost your mental health um, while staying inside, that's a good one, um, specifically at nighttime, because if you are able to sleep well, then you're definitely going to have better mental health overall. Um, creative expression and overall well-being um, are definitely linked. So um, you really want to experiment with things. Um, hold on one second. I'm sorry, I lost my lost my place. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I'm on the same one as you guys. Excuse me one second. I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, creative expression and overall well-being are linked. So experiment with like a new recipe, write a poem, paint, or um, look on Pinterest and find a new project um, because being creative is really good. Uh, show some love to someone in your life. It could be close, quality relationships are key for a happy, healthy life. Um, we talked in last time, talk about um, some different ways to stay connected, different ways to get creative and staying connected during the social distancing. Remember, even if you cannot be around other people, you can use a telephone, you can write letters, um, you can use face chat where you can see each other. There are all kinds of cool things that you can do now to still stay connected because that's really, really important. 
You want to uh, boost your brain power by treating yourself to a couple of pieces of dark chocolate every few days. The flavor noise, the caffeine, and the um, chocolate are thought to work together to improve alertness and mental skills. So even if you're, you've got a long work day, that might be a good way to, in the middle of your work day, try to build, um, boost your mental skills and your alertness. Just eat some dark chocolate. So sometimes you don't need to add new activities to have more pleasure. You just need to soak up the joy of the ones you already have. So trying to be optimistic doesn't mean ignoring the uglier sides of life. It just means focusing on the positive as much as, much as possible. So um, if you find yourself getting down or thinking about things that you weren't so good at or that you're not proud of, you want to try to flip those thoughts into positives and um, think of instead of, um, I wish I had done better, maybe I'm glad I got through that and from now on I will do better. Things of that sort just to really flip your negative thoughts into positive. Um, so if you're feeling anxious, you want to take a trip down memory lane and do some coloring. That sounds really childish, I know, but if you try some of the adult coloring books for about 20 minutes, it really it can uh, clear your mind. So I would suggest picking designs that are um, very geometric and a little complicated to have the best effect. The reason is because the more complicated the picture, the more um, focused you're gonna be on that picture and the better it's gonna divert your attention. So great diversion technique. Okay. <clears throat> Take time to laugh. Hang out with a funny friend. Watch a comedy, read a funny book. Laughter is so important because it actually reduces anxiety. So if you're feeling really stressed out at work or throughout the day, I would even suggest Googling funny videos, funny animal videos, funny baby videos, videos that sort of everybody finds funny. Um, that Because laughter is just so good for us and our overall well-being. <coughs> Another suggestion is to go off the grid. Leave your smartphone at home for a day and uh, disconnect from constant emails, alerts, and other interruptions. Spend time doing something fun with someone face to face. I think what we're forgetting a lot during this time of COVID is how important human connection is. Even if we are sitting six feet or 10 feet apart, just seeing our best friend or our loved one and having a face-to-face -face conversation can do wonders for our overall well-being. Dance around while you do your housework. So not only will you get your chores done, but dancing also reduces um, the stress hormones that we have and it increases endorphins, which is that body's feel good chemical. So any movement is gonna increase our endorphins, but dancing is extra fun. So I would definitely suggest it. Go ahead and yawn. Studies suggest that yawning helps cool the brain and improves alertness and mental efficiency. So if you feel like it, go ahead and do it. Relax in a warm bath once a week. So try adding some Epsom salts to soothe your aches and pains um, and help boost your magnesium levels, which can be depleted by stress as well. So it's an overall good thing to do for you. Has something been bothering you lately? If so, let it go, let it out, whether it be on paper. Writing about upsetting experiences can reduce symptoms of depression. It can also reduce the power that we give those events that we're writing about. So really think about that. I know a lot of people say, well, I haven't journaled in so long. Try it, it's really good for you. Um, Spend some time with a furry friend. A lot of us have them. Uh, time with animals actually lowers the stress hormone. 
and it boosts (laughs) oxygen, which stimulates feelings of happiness. If you don't have a pet, hanging out with a friend who does or going to a volunteer shelter is also a good idea. They're always looking for volunteers, so it helps you as well as the animals. Work some omega-3 fatty acids into your diet. Now, these are linked to decreased rates of depression and schizophrenia among their many benefits. Fish oil supplements work, but eating your omega-3 in foods like wild salmon, flax seeds, or walnuts also helps to build healthy gut bacteria, which is good to your overall well-being. Try to find the silver lining in something kind of bad that happened recently. Once again, trying to change those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Practice forgiveness. So even if it's just forgiving that person who cut you off during your commute, People who forgive have better mental health and report being more satisfied with their overall lives. Send a thank you note, not for a material item, but to let someone know why you appreciate them. Written expressions of gratitude are linked to increased happiness. Not to mention, I want you to think about how important it is when you receive something of gratitude from someone and then think of who in your life um, would you like to give that same sense of gratitude to and challenge yourself at writing down your feelings for them and giving it to them. Even if you live in the same house with them, it's still a great gesture and a great thing for both of you. And you will be amazed at how this can improve relationships. Um, do something with friends and family, like have a cookout, go to the park, play a game. People are 12 times more likely to feel happy on days that they spend six to seven hours with their family and friends. 12 times more likely to feel happy. That's great. And uh, I know that a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I don't know, during COVID, I've sort of spent way too much time with my family. And I completely understand that. But think about, are you, is this quality time you're spending? And if you can get outside of the house and do something different, like have a cookout at the park while social distancing at the same time, then that will be um, a more memorable event versus just being stuck in the house together. Um, Not to mention it promotes exercise and that's good for your overall well-being as well. Which leads us to our next one, take 30 minutes to go for a walk in nature. It could be a stroll through a park or a hike in the woods. Research shows that being in nature can increase energy levels and reduce depression, as well as boost your overall well-being. So um, I've said before, you know, exercise of any type is good, but when you get out in nature, you're just getting um, so many different benefits, not just from the exercise in itself, but being in nature as well. Do your best to enjoy 15 minutes of sunshine or apply sunscreen. So uh, sunlight gives us vitamin D, which experts believe is a mood elevator. So spending a little bit of time in the sun every day, especially if you're outside, um, is a good thing. So check that out. You can go outside, which is good for you. You can exercise, which is good for you, and be in the sunlight, which is good for you. All three of those you can knock out at one time. Super cool. Uh, So, okay, and really be mindful with the sun as well as um, with nature in general, Um, mindful of what you're seeing, mindful of what you're you're hearing, you're feeling, touching, and tasting. Doing those mindfulness exercises really helps your overall well-being. So you, I would really suggest practicing when outdoors. Um, and above all, trying something out of your comfort zone to make room for adventure and excitement in your life. Um, for a lot of people right now, uh, they feel that 
they're sort of stuck and they don't have control of much in their life, but you do have control of things. And so try to focus on the things that you can control. And one of those is um, the adventure in your life. Try something new, try something different and see if that helps, okay? So next, our next um, major topic is gonna be adjusting to big life changes. Okay, so there's a reason major life uh, shifts can impact our mental health, and it comes down to how our brain functions. When you change, it actually activates the conflict sensors in the brain, and this causes brain ca chaos that we call cognitive dissonance. So this acti activation of the conflict sensor becomes stressful to people. And not everyone is affected equally. Personality determines how change impacts our mental health. For the, so for those who seek novelty, change is usually easier to swallow, which those who feel um, more discomfort with a status quo will find life transitions more challenging. Positive change impacts our brains in the same way. So hear that again, positive change or negative change, either one affects our brains in the same way. The mental health implications during curious adjustments don't discriminate. Even change that's generally positive, such as celebrating your marriage or having a new baby, um, registers in the brain the same way as a more difficult event. The brain feels more comfortable with old patterns. Anything new presents a dilemma. So when it comes to positive life changes, the brain is different. Even if, it, if that change is positive, it can induce anxiety and uncertainty or a feeling of unfamiliar, unfamiliarity, and this generally precipitates habit pathways in the brain meaning as soon as you feel stress, you want to go back to old habits. So hear this, I want you to hear that last part one more time, meaning as soon as you feel stress, you want to go back to old habits. So a lot of times when we're having changes going on in our life, um, we instantly, because of how our brain is operating, we're instantly wanting to go back to what was comfortable, okay? So the way that we handle that is redirect uncertainty. The brain needs time to adjust, no matter the life event that's going, that you're going through. To help the process along and maintain our mental health, we can try a few of the following strategies, um, which is redirect uncertainty. One of the major reasons we struggle with change and why it can result in cognitive dissonance is the element of uncertainty. So uncertainty is the enemy of our biological impulses, pretty much. Our brain doesn't like the odds of equations with unknown variables. So it defaults to a negative bias for safety. So a study shows that in people who are uncertain, 75% of people mispredict when bad things are going to happen. The uncertainty biases the brain to accept the worst. That doesn't mean that change is great and you should follow and you should expect the best, but you should recognize that your brain is expecting the worst. And that is a safety mechanism. To help soothe the uncertainty that's causing the brain to fire its stress responses, level the playing field with neutral self-talk phrases, um, positive self-talk such as, you know, Uncertainty simply means I don't know the future. It does not mean the future is bad. Even though that's what my brain keeps going to, it does not mean that my future is bad. I'm just feeling uncertain. I think that's really important to um, take heed to during times like this of um, the COVID-19 pandemic is, you know, remembering that we're not certain, but it, so it doesn't mean um, that everything's going to be bad just because we're not certain of our future. Sometimes that's really hard to remember, but definitely important to remember when going through really big life changes. 
Okay, the next one is make a plan. We may not all be planners, but as we work through a major life shift, it's a good idea to become more organized. Rather than saying, I'll take it as it, as it comes, we'll see how we'll handle this, which often increases the amount of uncertainty right up front, the intentions more make the intentions more specific by adding things with actual time to it, by making the intentions more specific. You can decrease the uncertainty and therefore make it easier to embrace the change. So um, instead of I'll take it as it comes, we'll see how well, uh, how we'll handle this, Go ahead and be making a plan and preparing for how you're going to handle it, not just sort of sitting back and waiting for it to come. Sometimes, specifically in times such as this, that can be hard to do too if the uncertainty of the future um, makes it hard to make the plan. So that does happen sometimes. Um, next is a building in brain break. So many times, uh, change takes considerable focus. Whether you're planning a wedding, negotiating a new job, or starting a business, for example, it may seem prudent to push ourselves into overdrive during these times, but our brain really needs breaks throughout the day to run most efficiently. When you're focused, you are essentially collecting the different pieces of the puzzle with your mind. But unfocused time is the time you give to your mind to get these puzzle pieces together. So if you're going through a change with just continuous focus throughout the day, you're not giving your brain a chance to put these puzzle pieces together and really solve things wholly and completely. So Keep in mind, I just want you to hear once again, because we all do this when we're in uh, um, changing and stressful situation, we tend to go into overdrive, push ourselves harder. Do not do that. You need to take breaks. Um, if you do not take breaks, you're going to be um, doing yourself a disservice because you're not thinking at your same uh, capacity. So another one, the next one is, when dealing with big life changes, you need to deal with the things at hand. If that is grief and loss, then you have to deal with grief and loss. Sadly, many major life changes are events we don't ask for, such as losing a loved one or suffering injury or illness. Both difficult and positive adjustments may feel like a loss as we let go of one way of being for a new path. But grief and loss can often be found at the heart of major life changes, especially ones that we have little or no for. But the big ones are typically depression and or anxiety. So if you're dealing with the big life adjustment of a loss and grief, I really want you to pay attention and be mindful that this is a different type of life adjustment. And it is one that a lot of people need help with getting through. And that's okay. Just be mindful that you may need help to get through that. And that is okay to ask for help. I would actually suggest that you do gather your support. Um, within your immediate family and understand that you it's not as easy to get through that type of um, life adjustment, okay? And it can sometimes lead to depression and anxiety. Um, and if it does, then I would suggest that you reach out for help. And we'll talk more about that at the end. Next, um, when you're going through a big life adjustment, you really want to practice self-care. Self-care is an old standard, but an important one. Don't forget the importance of self-care, including maintaining just a regular schedule, eating healthy, sleeping enough, and exercising. Those are the basics of self-care. Often with major life changes, self-care goes right out the window. 
once again, we're sort of pushing into overdrive and we're thinking we have to get through this. We have to keep pushing until this is over. And so we just completely forget about self-care. It can help to choose one thing each and every day that you do just for you and your own well-being, such as exercising, meditating, journaling. A lot of times it's even good to schedule these things to make sure that they are going to be done. Um, and, of course, reach out for help when you need it, whether that's a trusted loved one who can lend an ear or if it's a man through any major life transition. Either way, know to reach out and um, ask for help from your support. Now, the next slide is recognizing warning signs. I've talked throughout all of the slides and the different scenarios and objectives of tools to thrive. I've talked about um, there are some cases where you may need professional help. So in order to recognize if you need professional help, one thing to do is to continue to monitor new or worsening symptoms you may be experiencing with either your mental health or your overall health and well-being. So if you notice that you're feeling depressed, you might want to start um, keeping a track on your calendar of how many days was I depressed this week? How many, did that decrease or increase next week and the next week? Just sort of keeping track and making sure that things aren't getting worse. Keep in mind you want to also track, are you sleeping well? Are you eating the same? Are your eating or sleeping habits changing in any way? Because that, that's also important when determining if um, your symptoms are sort of getting to the point that you need to see a mental health professional. Another thing that I want to point out is that hoping mental health problems such as anxiety or depression will go away on their own can lead to worsening symptoms. If you have concerns that you or someone you know is experiencing worsening of mental health symptoms, please ask for help. Um, I'm going to give you um, some additional resources whenever on our next slide, and I'll give you some numbers to give to your loved ones as well as to yourself if you feel that you do need help and you do need to reach out to a mental health professional. And finally, one thing that I suggest to everyone is to please remember, um, just as you could be going through these things, so could others. So always check in on other people and, you know, maybe even share the information that you've learned today and that can start a conversation to check in on them and see if they have any of these same issues. Um, it's just always good to check in on others and, and sort of monitor your loved one's symptoms as well. And the main way to, and the main way to do that is through talking. So next is our mental health resources. I've talked about if you need mental health. Well, a lot of people say, well, what if I do? Who do I call? <clears throat> um, this Colorado Crisis Services line is one of the best things in Colorado. Okay, it's free. You can call it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on the holidays. They're open. You can speak to a live clinician by calling 1-844-493-8255. Or you can even text this line by texting, texting TALK to 38255. That is a, um, we also have the website listed as well for www.coloradocrisisservices.org. Um, another thing that I want you to keep in mind is Jefferson Center. We have the main line listed, which is 303-425-0300. We are still taking um, new clients. So if, please do not suffer thinking that no one is open or that we're not accepting new clients during this time because we are and we are available to help you. The next slide is some links to additional helpful resources. 
Um, these are just some things that I found while researching these topics and thought that I would um, share with you. One of them is actually adult coloring pages. So that link will lead you to some of the more interesting coloring pages that I was discussing that and suggesting for you to try. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. Just really anxious to see if anyone has any questions at this point. Angela, thank you so much. And as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll answer them. Um, we have had a few come in. So um, Angela, the first one I have is, um, after hearing the presentation, I think I'm definitely struggling with burnout. I'm finding that I get really angry and irritable by some of the requests from my coworkers and that it's also starting to seep into my home life with my husbands and kids. Um, how can I be less angry? So, you know, following some of the <clears throat> following some of the tips and, and tricks that I was talking about in the slides, but the main ones that definitely come to mind right away is talking with your supervisor if you have one. I'm not sure if you're, you know, like in a home business or what, but if talking to your supervisor or your coworkers and really brainstorming on how can we make this a better situation. A lot of times what people don't realize is by you raising the question of how can we make this easier for everybody, that usually seems to get more people on board versus sort of just complaining that, you know, you guys are driving me crazy. Um, so really talking about it with your team is one thing. Talking about it with human resources is definitely also another suggestion. Um, also talking at home, you know, if you're working from home, really talking to your family members and setting boundaries and understanding of, okay, listen, when this door is shut, I'm having to focus solely on work um, versus when this door is open or cracked, that's okay. So you come in and ask me a question, things of that sort, um, you know, coming up with just things that work with the coworkers as well as people at home. Also, you know, just once again, taking those breaks. I think that all too often we push ourselves too hard and we forget that it is okay to take a break. And a lot of times from a lot of people that I've talked to that are specifically working from home right now are finding that they're pushing themselves even harder <laughs> because they're at home. So they feel that they have even more to prove um, because they're working from home. So just be really careful of that and mindful of that and be really good to yourself. And then at the end of it, you know, as discussed in the slides, that sometimes we actually have to you know, change positions in our jobs or change jobs altogether um, to really be able to break that burnout and and feel refreshed and like you're you're good again. So it, it can it can be a variety of things and it can be on a large spectrum from just talking about it all the way to finding a new job. But I would definitely suggest trying talking about it and all the other techniques first. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, I recently lost my job and sometimes I do okay, but other times I'll suddenly be hit with a wave of anxiety because I don't know what's next for me. What are some ways that I can calm down and handle, handle those feelings in the moment? So self-talk is really good. You know, reminding yourself that, um, it is going to be okay, that um, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties right now, but um, that everything will be okay, reminding yourself of, of other times that um, you were uncertain and didn't know what the future held, but it turned out to be okay. Uh, also, you know, uh, controlling the things that you can control or focusing on, on the things that you can control. Um, even though you can't control that you may be out of work, you can control how many hours a day you put into looking for work. You can control what specific types of employment you're looking for. So really focusing on the things that you can control. 
is huge there as well. Um, simpler in the moment is even doing, you know, like deep breathing skills and where you're, I'll just plot this one real quick with you. Um, you breathe in, it's called box breathing. You breathe in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds and breathe it out for four seconds. So you would breathe in, hold it, breathe out, breathe in, hold it, breathe out. If you do a few sets of those, um, even in the moment, it can calm you down pretty quickly. So that's just a, um, you know, just a quick tip that you could use as well. If, and I would definitely not just go off of that small um, uh, description that I gave you. I would even suggest Googling deep breathing exercises and practice practice it. Um, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there that are great for practicing deep breathing. And I would definitely suggest um, practicing those smaller coping skills when you are calm and you're not in a moment of stress. Some people make that mistake of only practicing when in the moment of crisis. Um, you want to make sure you practice when calm. Okay, and another thing to remember is that another thing about having those waves sort of hit you of anxiety. Also, remember that, you know, losing a job and losing employment is like grief, too. And that's how grief hits you in waves. So you could also, you know, be dealing with sort of several different issues. And I would suggest that if those waves of anxiety continue and, or if they get worse, maybe even seeking professional help. Great, thank you. And then we have one final question. Um, and this person says, um, I've heard a lot of, about mindfulness, but I don't really know what it is. Um, is that things like meditation and yoga um, and is mindfulness and activities related to it, does that help your boost, boost your mental health? And do you have any suggestions for resources? Yes, uh, mindfulness is, is it, it, it reminds me of meditation to some degree, but I would say it's a little bit different in the same, because you could be out in a park around or around a lot of people and um, be practicing mindfulness versus with meditation. I usually think of, you know, you needing to be in a quiet environment or harmonious environment where you're able to, um, sort of focus when meditating versus when you're being mindful, um, you are focused, but you're not, like I said, you, you don't have to necessarily be in a tranquil environment. So a way that you can practice mindfulness, for example, just by being outside, say you go to the park and you sit in the grass and, um, one way to be even more mindful is take your socks and shoes off when in the grass and feel the grass with your hands and your feet and really think about what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, you're tasting, you're touching and being mindful of that blade of grass. Does it feel sticky? Um, is it long? Is it short? How green is it? How green is it compared to the tree that you're sitting beside? Things of that sort, really focusing on the here, the now, focusing on my surroundings. Um, another way uh, that you could be in a large crowd and be focusing on mindfulness is you may be in a restaurant and be extremely anxious because you're around a lot of people, but you um, focus on you're eating. So you're really getting into the flavors that you taste, the textures, textures that you're feeling, um, how it smells to you, uh, how it feels to touch the food, you know, really diving into the details of the food that you're eating. And that can also help to divert your attention away from being anxious about all the people around you. So it's different ways to use these uh, mindfulness techniques. And I really, in regards uh, to 
suggestions, I would really suggest going once again on just Google, um, Google mindfulness techniques and go on YouTube and search mindfulness techniques. They've got all kinds of great, um, anywhere from seminars on them to just basic YouTube videos of practicing showing you how to do them. Um, so you can find an abundance of information just by Googling mindfulness techniques or going on YouTube and searching that. Great. Thank you. Well, did, did I answer all did that answer all parts of that question? I want to yes. Yeah, I think you did. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was good. I know it was a complicated question. So um, I, I think that's actually all the questions that we have time for today. So Angela, thank you so much for the informative presentation. Uh, and just to let everybody know, the good times and the bad, Jefferson Center is here with you for every step of the way. Um, you can visit our website at jcmh.org or follow us book for more resources and information. And you can also reach us by calling 303-425-0300. Um, and thank you all for coming and have a great day.